great way to start. I think you should just play something. <laughs> it's what I do, so yeah, let's go. that's what I'm most comfortable at. Why don't we start at the very beginning? Sure. I think rather than me telling everyone who you are, it might make more sense for you too. Okay. Um, well, first of all, my name is C. Landsbaum. C okay. is a nickname that I had from when I was a little kid. My Hebrew name is Shimon. Okay. And uh, I just uh, decided to call myself C for whatever reason when, when I was 10, and I called my best friend T, and he kept his name <laughs> forever. Good. I was born in Neptune, New Jersey, which is like by Asbury Park. Uh, first nine years of my life, we lived in Farmingdale, New Jersey, and then we moved to Lakewood, New Jersey, which is now, people say, oh, Lakewood. <laughs> right. Probably very different. But my parents, yes, yeah, very different now, but it, was, it had a, a, a lot of, you know, big Jewish community. And I was surrounded by, my parents were Holocaust survivors. Um, my dad had a very sad story where my grandfather was shot and killed when, when the Nazis first came into town. He was holding his hand, and uh, oh, wow. so I never had a chance to to connect to my dad's parents, and he went through a lot. And also, my sadly, my dad passed away very young, 42 years old. And then my mom was born in Warsaw. They were both from Poland, and uh, luckily, there's many stories that go along with that. But they were able to get out to Siberia, and uh, they survived. So I was very close to my mom's side and, and uh, my grandparents and uh, from her side because they survived and um, when I was seven years old my dad came home with a guitar for my brother for his 10th birthday my older brother and I said I want to do that too so I was seven and I remember to this day how it felt to have that guitar in my hands and they they brought home a, a, a guitar teacher Mr. Ditzel Russ Ditzel and I just remember like being so into what I was doing you know, like saliva drips on <laughs> the concentration. Away, right. Yeah, and uh, and for my eighth birthday, they bought me an electric guitar, and I remember come, they came home with the brochure. I still have that guitar downstairs, which I can show you later. And uh, so, really, I started playing when I was seven, and uh, I still do the same thing today as I, as I've wow. always done. And uh, getting into, um, we weren't, we were very Jewish. And I had all these immigrants around me, but we weren't uh, orthodox. Okay. Uh, it was it was it was a little bit of a, a struggle I can see with my parents because of what they went through. So some people became religious. My father just kind of like was like anti-religious, but very Jewish. You have to be Jewish, you know, no matter what. What do you mean by that? Uh, okay, if I gave you st I, when An I was in eighth grade, <laughs> when I was eighth grade, I. Uh, was the first time I went to public school. They sent me to Yeshiva, Hebrew Day School, uh, B'Tzalel Hebrew Day School. So I was in this school with like 28 kids and two girls, and two girls, which sadly weren't the prettiest girls. So I always was, be were, was, was begging my parents, send me to public school. So they finally did in eighth grade. So in eighth grade, and it was like, whoa. And so I remember coming home with two girls, right? We had drank some Boone's Farm apple wine. This is eighth grade, right? What are, how old are you, 13 or right. something? And so, and my father was kind of proud. Oh, we, my, my son's coming home with a couple of girls that night, you know. And he said, were they Jewish? And I said, I think one was and one isn't. He said, do you know the difference? I said, no, I don't care. And he went, gave me the, wow. it was sad in a way, right. but he gave me the There's biggest a le lesson learned. Lesson learned big time, never to say anything anymore. Right. <laughs> and so that's, that's what I mean. He was very, I remember seeing him one time uh, come home bloody from like fighting somebody so he was very Jewish he was very you know Proud. from going through the war but not connected to Yiddish guy they, my mom did light Shabbos candles um, which was beautiful what were your earliest musical memories Do you remember was there music played in the house yes um, music was always played in my house and, and the, the radio and so I was just very connected to all the music that was um, 
being played on the ra AM radio, actually. And uh, as, as young as I can remember, three, four years old, uh, just having an impact hearing the Beatles. I remember seeing like yeah. many stories, the, seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Sullivan and uh, just it's just something that I knew that I wanted to do. So I always really paid attention to that and felt connected to that. And I see it in my grandchildren as well. Wow. What was next? High school? Um, yeah, well, I was in high school in Lakewood. So I went to public high school and I was always playing music and uh, in different rock bands. And I played in the in the high school band. And uh, I started st studying, like I said, when I was seven, but it was on and off. When I was around 14, a friend of mine turned me on to this person named Lenny Tristano, who if you look up encyclopedia books, is uh, known for creating freeform jazz. And okay. so I would take a bus from Lakewood to Manhattan, because that's where um, they were all at. It was like a little cult, Lenny Tristano, and I studied with this um, sax player, Lenny Popkin. And um, he taught me a lot about music as far as like uh, jazz. And what, we, what he'd have me do is like take a, a Charlie Christian, which w was one of my heroes, uh, one of the first electric guitar players. Um, he died very young, but um, he was very melodic. And um, what Lenny would have me do is, is take a solo and learn to sing it with like a cassette. Okay. You know, and once you learned how to sing it perfectly, you have to come and sing it without anything. And then once you sang it without anything, he said, now go to your guitar and play it. So it taught me a very deep connection to my instrument. Right, because you were basically internalizing really what you wanted to play so that it just became one yes, with you. Yes, and, and it felt very good. And I also remember seeing my parents, you know, like sneak and hear what I was doing. And they knew that it just soothed me. So I always saw music as right. a very healing thing for myself and for others. Right. And, and you said, so at some point you, you were in Israel. When did you live in Israel? What point in your life? Okay, so that's very uh, interesting period of my life. I was playing in Manhattan. I was uh, 19 years old and my heroes were like John McLaughlin, uh, who's an amazing, he's on tour now, amazing jazz guitar player and like Carlos Santana. Sure. And they were, like, they were getting into like Indian roots. And I just was always very Jewish. And I had met somebody, he said, oh, you should connect to your Jewish roots. There's a really a cool rabbi on 79th Street. I was living on 86th Street. There's a lot to these stories, but um, I went and uh, I went uh, Erev Pesach actually, and I knocked on, thinking I'm knocking on regular rabbi's door, you know, saying, can I spend Pesach with you? Right. Basically, I knocked on the door and they brought me upstairs and I met Shlomo Karlbach. Oh, wow. And uh, I was very taken with his teaching, his okay. learning. I know that he was a great musician, composer, most people don't realize what I connected to was his Devar Torahs, how he gave over the interpretation of everything. And I was very fascinated and, ta and taken with it. And then in addition, he was a great musician, so it was uh, a great composer. And, and, and uh, that was just uh, like icing on the cake. And he saw how on fire I was to learn. He, he told me to get the five books, the Chumashes, the art scrolls, and get my tefillin and asked me if I wanted to come to Israel, and he paid for my ticket to come to Israel. No way, Shlomo Kobach paid for your ticket. Yeah. But, but before you carry on, I, I just want to tap into that moment. Do you remember when you first walked into the room and, and he was there? What was it like? Yes, he was very char charismatic and very kind. And I remember it was like almost like this, but two regular chairs, and we mm -hmm. sat together, and he just asked me some questions about my life. And... I told him, like, you know, I'm a musician, what I'm doing, and we really connected. He said, go get your tefillin and come back, and I'll, we'll put on tefillin wow. together. So. Okay, so he got you a ticket to Israel? Yes. We flew together, actually. Oh, you flew together? Yes. Did he mention at that point, like, performing with him or playing with yeah, him? That's a very good question, because uh, when he asked me to go to Israel, remember, I've been a musician my whole life. Right. How old are you at this point? this point, I'm 19 years 19, old. 19, okay. Uh, he, I said to him, should I bring my guitars? He said, how could you not? <laughs> so I was ready to learn. I right. was ready to go into another area. And, but he saw how the guitar was me. You right. know, so how, you know, how can I not take them? And so I remember landing in Israel, and there was an original Moshav band that, that backed oh. him up. Uh, 
and um, they picked him up. And who, me, who was that, Ben Sion? Ben, well, it's not Ben Sion. He had Diaspora Yeshiva Band. Okay. It was Moshe Dushkis, Reuven uh, Gilmore, uh, Yankla Shemesh. And, uh, they were living on Moshev Modin yes, at the time, and so was that the, was Moshev. Okay, yeah, and wow. it was Moshev Band, and that. they were doing all these like different little gigs, and they were backing up Shlomo for wow. Shlomo's gigs. So I remember they came and picked us up, and Shlomo said, hey, Ever, come meet Shimon Landsbaum, because he started calling me Shimon, you know, right. Shimon, and because um, he wouldn't accept anything else but <laughs> Jewish. And um, they said, oh, no, Shlomo, not another guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> it was hysterical. I'm like, but by the second day, I was gigging nonstop. Right. You wow. know, and uh, I, and uh, it was a beautiful experience because I did all their gigs with them, and I did all the backing of Shlomo gigs all over the country. For how long? For what kind of time period? Um, 19, for about a year in 1981, early 80s, you know, so um, it was right at the tip of his career and he was sadly, you know, one person once told me, you see the same people going up is coming down, which is a cliche, but it's true. Mm, right. and, I, and so he was more on his, like, you know, rolling down a little bit, but l luckily I, I caught him at that point. And what was that like, performing with him, touring with him? Okay, that was like, okay, being a young kid, being very influenced by the Ullman Brothers, I thought, okay, by the time I'm 22, I'm going to be in the Ullman Brothers. This was my vision. Right. Uh, and then here, all of a sudden, here I am, 20, uh, and, and in Israel. <laughs> and, it would, and he never told me what to do. I didn't realize the Kozer, Bachuva, Balchuva, whatever, but uh, I just was going for the ride, you know? And I just remember being on stage with him at one point and saying to myself, I knew that the, musically it wasn't the highest level, you know, right. everybody that sure. was playing. But I said, oh, this feels like just as good as if I was playing with Jerry Garcia, because it was so deep and so much meaning to me. Right. So I remember that, but that was that moment, and then I had to move on, and eventually I had to like tell Shlomo, Shlomo, I can't play with all these people that have been playing for one day, because if he starts out of tune, I sound out of tune, and only call me when you really need me. And, how, uh, how did it work? Did he just meet someone who was a musician and say, hey, come with to my gig tonight? Or yeah. Really, that's how it was? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He, it was amazing. And not only that was that so amazing, I remember when I moved back at one point to New York, we lived you know, right around the shul there, I had been asked to be the musical director because he had been doing Malava Malkas. And I got the highest end musicians, like... It wasn't Andy Statman, it was Kenny Kosak, you know, it was, it was all these really high-end musicians. And it was kind of a little bit sad because I watched, we had to say, no, you can't come sit in or whatever. Right. And it was not as high, it was not as deep, it was not as there. So interesting. And I remember me and Shlomo sitting together and Shlomo said, I don't think it's working. And I said, I know, it's not working. We have to be able, he had to be able to invite everybody up. It was, right. it was, was who, he, who he was. It wasn't about, oh. That's why he came in when he did a show. He wasn't hiding in the back and making it, you know, oh, who, where is it? Like, we all have to do, right. we have to, like, kind of make ourselves a little bit bigger than we are. He'd come in from the main door and say right. hello to everybody. And, and I guess he also... on me. Right. Yeah. He, he was also, um, I guess his concerts, they were much less a passive experience and more it was, you know, him and the musicians trying to be one with people and, and sing along. It wasn't like, yeah. hey, watch us shred and do exactly. wild musical stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a beautiful lesson in that way. So I always felt like uh, I was there to support him and it was, it was a beautiful role for me to right. be able to support him and be the young energy and keep, keep it going, you know. Wow. Okay, so after that, you're in Israel. Did you stay in Israel after, or what was next? Yes. So I started um, working with different is Israeli stars because I was in the in the Tel Aviv circuit. So okay. um, I worked with uh, Shalom Chano, who's uh, oh, wow. like a Bob Dylan of, of Israel, sure. and then uh, some other people, like Yarden Arazi, who was like uh, she toured all over Europe. It was it was very cool experience. Yoram Gaon. Um, I got a lot of gigs with, uh, it became Yigal Bashan's guitar player and uh, a lot of more other people. So it was doing all these productions uh, due to Fisher at one mm -hmm. point and um, that, it was a wonderful life for me there. Wow. I really enjoyed it. Um, I had said to myself, I'm going to be big fish in, in, in a little pond. Right. <laughs> right. And I thought, I pretty much got close to it. There's, there's some great musicians in Israel. Yeah. So, I, I couldn't get to number one. There's just too many good people. Right. But I got to like three or four, you know, and 
and I was on TV all the time and wow. I had a nice home and the contrary to what people say you struggle in Israel I I was like whoa I'm right. doing Can well make a nice life there yeah, yeah I had a nice life but I was always a blues guitar player and and I and I had to return to America for that reason there be an Israel. audience for it also yeah mm -hmm. wider audience and uh, being very American, my Hebrew was terrible, mm, right. so I, can, I never felt I can really connect as deep as I want to. I, sure. I sh really should, even now, still, so hopefully I will again right. at some point. At some point after coming back, you, I mean, I'm sure there's been many groups, some of which I don't even know about, but there's one that definitely comes to mind that I grew up on, which is Soul Farm. Yes. What's the, what's the story of Soul Farm? Okay, so before Soul Farm, it was called Innocence, one word, I-N-A-S-E-N-S-E, -S -E -S -E, and that's how we really started. It, it really, the, the, the seed started in Israel, um, because when, I, when Shlomo first brought me to Israel, I met Ben Sion Solomon, it was Diaspora Shiva, and I actually started playing in that band because uh, I, uh, Avram Rosenblum wanted to take a little break, so I took his place. And Ben Sion has a lot of kids, Solomon brothers, right. which we all know, which are amazingly talented. Like on Shabbos, you'd see them. That was my vision. Like, oh, this is like church. You know, they're all <laughs> singing together. Finally, I found somebody, you know, that's like that. And so um, my partner in Soul Farm, Noah Solomon, uh, he was 10 years younger than me. So I had to wait till he grew up. But I remember uh, on a pace, uh, uh, no, on a Purim, we had a jam on the Moshav, and it was Noah and me, and they brought us together because they were excited about Noah, and they were excited right. about me, and uh, we played together, and that's where the seed was born. Let's let's go to America and uh, pursue this. Last wow, so you guys moved back here together. Yes, wow. and uh, we started in a sense, and we did get a record deal a year later. We worked mm -hmm. very hard, and um, we started really from nothing. It's almost like playing music is like, it's just a dream. You know, it's we were terrible. <laughs> we have to really grow into <laughs> right. into ourselves. It's like, it's amazing how you can have misconceptions of yourself. Oh, we, you know, we just didn't. We just went for it, and uh, in a sense, in the end, as we embraced more of our Jewish events, we turned it into soul farm. What kind of music was it before it became soul farm? Uh, it was strictly jam band music, okay. and uh, kind of like in the uh, Grateful Dead Fish uh, sure. realm of things, um, and. That's that's basically because it was sometimes they would even call it uh, the Allman Brothers meets the Middle East because I did some of those influences. Sure. But I was still always a blues Southern rock player. Wow, well, I remember hearing all that stuff on the way to school. I went to school. It was about forty-five minutes away. It was a long drive. Right. From where we lived, and um, I think it, my mum used to play us. It was like Yosef Cardona, Neshama Kalbach, Solfa. Those were like the oh, nice. things I remember as a kid. Yeah. Dead Grass is a more recent thing, right? Yes. Dead Grass, I kind of started uh, about eight years ago, and then the pandemic has been in the middle of sure. that. But yeah, um, just as a fun thing. Um, That's more embracing the jam band kind yes, of stuff. Yes, yes, and, and more of the secular world, because I'm constantly in, in, in both, you know, both directions. Um, and uh, that's been taking off. and. Uh, it's just out of my love for uh, uh, the music of Jerry Garcia. I never really thought I'd uh, do, be a tribute band, so, and we aren't really, because I, I, I just do things very differently. Sure. But we utilize their music, which is right now uh, bigger than ever. It's kind of amazing. So I find it very fortunate that um, I got into that. That's awesome. Yeah. If I were to ask you, what is Jewish music? What would you say? Ooh. Um, that's so, it's, it's a really deep question because I don't really know the answer. So the first thing that comes to mind, what is Jewish music, is Shlomo Karlbach. That's, okay. to me, uh, I remember being asked when I was in uh, that first year of public school, what is jazz? Mm -hmm. And no, we didn't know, you know, we were in music class or something, and the teacher said, Louis Armstrong. So that's why I say Shlomo Karlbach, it's the same sure. type of thing. But you we got to go back to the roots. There's so much going on. Like when you're in Israel, like all the different, you know, Middle Eastern roots, you know, Sephardic, this, you know. So I don't know. It's a mishmash of, uh, of cultures. Right. Almost like a, a sonic version of who we are as a people. It's yeah. Like, yes. Um, yeah. It's a tough question. It I don't is. Really know. And, and I don't know if you, 
if you heard about this, but at the at the Grammys right now, there's um, they're trying to discuss. That's actually something I want to get to separately about your Grammy. Right. Um, but they wanted to discuss um, introducing a, a category for Jewish music. Really? Yeah, and they actually invited me to. It was like a meeting with I think maybe like thirty people on the Zoom call. Uh huh. Um, I was kind of just observing to see what was going on, and I could see that one of the things that was going to make this a struggle is that. Um, how do you define it? You know, there are so many genres, there are so yes. many styles, and is it the person or is it the message or you know, is Bob Dylan's music Jewish? Right. You know. Well, the reason why I say Shlomo Karlbach is because that he he st strictly like you know that's who he was. Everything was right. Yiddishkeit. Everything. So even to the point where he didn't want to listen to any other influences. So when the song came down to him, it really came down to him. Sure. So that was my experience. But then you have klezmer, you have, you know, right. you have, you know, what is Jewish food? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think about that all the time. Is right. it a filter fish? Okay, it is. Yes. Right. Okay. Now, yeah, is yeah. it a deli? I guess so. I don't know. I guess also as a people, you know, having been spread all around the world for many years, we kind of pick up a little bit of everything in, in the same way that we do with food or other parts of the culture. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's kind of, it's part of why I like the question so much is because it, it, I think it just means something different to everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, I was uh, talking to someone else who's, um, she's a, a Chabad, she grew up in the Chabad community and she, she loves and grew up with Chabad Nigunim. So for right. her, that's what it is. Yes. Yeah, I remember my mom sitting me down and playing, they had Yiddish records and playing me Oifin Pripachik mm -hmm. and, try, and explaining me the words. So to me, it, I guess that was Jewish music right. in the beginning. Of my, so that's a powerful, powerful melody. Yeah. Um, we mentioned the Grammys, yes. and I happen to know that there's one sitting in this room. Yes. Can you tell us a story about that? Sure. It connects back to my Shlomo Karlbach roots in some ways, this Grammy story, because Pesach was when I met Shlomo, and it was uh, coming to Pesach time, and I got uh, asked to do this recording session, to engineer it actually, because okay. uh, I, I, I studied engineering like um, later on when things became all digital. I said, oh, this is something I can do besides play guitar. And uh, I remember like the first sessions, they told me it was for Pete Seeger, which is a well-known name to me. Yeah. And um, sadly, it was Pesach night, so I turned it down. Um, little did I know that they were going to call me again, and then it turned into like four years of work, and wow. I, I ended up uh, recording a lot of his last four records in life and meeting him and, and uh, meeting a lot of people involved with Pete and a really dear friend of mine, a percussionist, percussionist named Jeff Haynes, who really, I have to always give him credit because he brought me into that world, and he's a wonderful percussionist, plays with a lot of my heroes, Herbie Hancock, Nice. Pat Metheny, um, so, and he needed help. And so, um, and Pete lived in Beacon, New York, which is not too far from where I live. And uh, I would go up there and do uh, tons of recording sessions. And one of the albums that we did, and I played a lot of guitar, and I wrote, I think, a song or two for the album, actually, where Pete is actually speaking some poetry that my brother wrote. So it was very... Uh, very special experience for me and that album came out and won a Grammy and wow. it was like the biggest day of my life to win a Grammy. I, I wasn't there because I was actually at my daughter's, um, uh, there, there was a big fundraiser for Kushner School. They had used all my music for their documentaries and so I was actually there but and we were like the main song of the night and they announced and C. Lansbaum is here to perform their song, and he just won a Grammy. So I wasn't at the Grammys, but I w it was- That's how you found out? No. Yeah, it was like 800. Well, my wife was on the phone too. She oh, was like, okay, okay. Wow. she was watching. <laughs> and well, she said, you feel? won, you won. So I remember, and it was like 700 people. So it was almost better because there, it was like a beautiful experience for me. You almost had like your own- Yeah, um, my own thing happened ceremony. there. Wow. And uh, it was a beautiful experience. And then I did another couple albums for him where I thought, oh, I'm gonna win a Grammy again, because. You, you get a little greedy. Sure, sure. You like <laughs> and it had like Bruce Springsteen on it, right. so I had a chance to mix Bruce and 
uh, wow. Amarello and, and Emmylou Harris and all these people. I said, okay, this is going to win. Nope, nothing. Right. You know, so you never know. It's you all in God's know. hands. Yeah. It's like win the, winning the lottery a little bit, right. but the truth is you, you have to be ready. Yeah. I worked hard for it. You know, yeah. It's a good validation. Sure. Um, yeah. It was sad, you know, because my dad passed away so young, Shlomo Kralbach was like my father. Oh, father you know, he, I right. would ask him a lot of things, not just as a Rebbe, but like as a dad. And so he did not want me to come back to America. Okay. He, he loved yeah, Israel, you know. You sure you want to go back then? And I said, Shlomo, I have to go back. You know, I have to, it's just something I have to go back and, and do here, you know. So, but uh, yeah, being in Israel, it always feels like being home. Sure. You feel whole. That's the whole thing. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I was, I was back a couple of weeks ago for a family bar mitzvah. And, you know, even though it's been two years since I, um, since I actually lived there, it's, it is home, whether it, whether yeah. whether you're officially you know there or not. I always say we all have to move to America so we can buy all the nice gear <laughs> and put it in the Aliyah shipment and take it there. <laughs> I did that, really? and then I ended up selling did, it all over, over there. <laughs> yeah, because I ended up moving to LA. <laughs> I act, actually did that at one point. I said, okay, this is it, and then I moved everything there. And then so, it, wait, did you move from Israel to LA? Uh, I moved. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. What what was in LA? What happened during those that time? Um, I was looking to, once again, per, pick up on pursuing my career as a studio guitar player. And um, there was a, um, a guitar player um, that had been doing most of the sessions um, in L.A. And I remember I, I had taught myself to be a really good sight reader um, because I, that's how I, come out. I started working immediately in, in Israel. Um, I remember like taking like four years of my life and practicing sight reading for like four hours a day. Wow. And um, so I, I read his book, uh, Tommy Matola is his name. He passed away a few years ago, but he, he's like probably one of the most recorded guitar players, you know, like in that whole wrecking crew scene sure. of musicians. And I went through his book and at the end of his book he said, and if you come to LA, you can call me up. If you finish this book, and it's the only book I ever finished, actually. I always get like halfway through a book. I went all the way to the end. It was, it was uh, quite a strange book in some ways. But uh, it said, call me up and I'll bring you to a session. So my dream was to become a session guitar player in Los Angeles. And I moved there. And um, he did, in fact, pick me up on a street corner. It took me to a big movie thing. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me that night to sit in. And I did. And I felt I did a terrible job. But whatever, I right. did it. And, uh, but then I realized that being that kind of studio musician was not, uh, my temperament was not designed for that. You know, you have to be right. very, like, no mistakes. Yeah, very disciplined, very rigid. Very disciplined. Yeah. I'm all about, I make lots of mistakes. That's, right. what can I do? That's my life. Because <laughs> it's it's we're human. Yeah. I started doing something over the last couple of years where I'll book a studio session for three hours um, and I'll record an improvised piano album and a big part of um, being okay with that process and, and doing it was knowing that there's going to be mistakes yes. and knowing that if I stop in the middle because I made that one mistake then I'm going to lose the entire thing that was before it and potentially after it yes. and that we're not supposed to be perfect and it's okay and, yes. the f and then when I uploaded the, f the first track like that to it was like a really bad, bad note, like it, like, it's like a slip of the finger. <laughs> right, right. And I was like, this is going online forever now. And there was actually something quite freeing about it. It's like, yeah. guess what? I'm a, I'm a human. There are know? amazing people out there that don't make mistakes. There right. are, but it, it, yeah, I'm not that person. Yeah. I'm, I'm about making mistakes and, um, you know, then connecting into Yiddishkeit, I, that's where I learned that mistakes are holy, you know, because that's what you learn from. We're not talking about those mistakes, though. Right. <laughs> That's a mistake. But uh, I meant to go. Right. And um, so it's it's uh, it's it is um, freeing to be able to say, you know, I am who I am, and this is what it is. And that's why in my recording world, uh, I I really am focused on real sure. instruments, really playing, really getting people together in a room. Because that's where I thrive. Capturing you know, it, that spirit. Yes, yeah. if we're playing together, that's 
there's something that you can't replace as opposed to doing everything one piece at a time. Even if you get great players in, it's still not the same as 100%. when you have everybody together. So, I mean, there's people that do great stuff the other way, but it's just sure. for me. A lot of my work is like that. I mean, I have session musicians around the world, and if, I, if I'm working on multiple projects at once, I, I can't be everywhere, I can't be all the sessions, and it's like, okay, guitars from here, cellos from there. And, yes, yeah. um, which is an amazing thing that we can do it right. in our world. Right, the fact that technology allows it is amazing. But for me, I, I like that's why, like you know, uh, originally I called you up because I really want to. I love documenting, like you know, if we do something together, play something together, and whatever it is, you know, it's nice. That's what we have to leave the world, you know. Yeah. Do you have a, I guess, favorite Jewish tune or nigun or something that you connect with in a in a deeper way to maybe others? Yeah. Um, well, I really don't because I love all music and I love all different things, but it sparks. A couple of different memories. One is the first memory of, of of hearing, you know, Shlomo. I remember being outside the shul and looking in, and he was sitting playing, uh, and it was um, like Shachenad. So, um, wow. so, so it brings brings that memory. I, I I really do feel that music is about memories, sure. and that's why we are always connected into our eras, because it sparks that memory. And so, and that's why I'm glad that I have given people out of memories. And then it's the other song, Oifen Pripachik, because my mom sat me down, and and it was so deep for her, and where she came from, Poland, and all right. the Holocaust, and her trying to explain me what these words mean, and. She knew that I didn't. That this is what I was going to do: be a musician. Yeah. Even though she didn't want it, she wanted me to be anything but a musician. I was going to ask you earlier: were they supportive? But I guess. Well, they sadly, my dad died at 42. My mom died at 52. But I remember when I was living in Israel, my mom came and visited me, and she went to my one of my shows, and she did say to me, "I'm so sorry, I didn't. I wasn't even more supportive for you because uh -huh. they didn't really want me to be a musician, but they saw that." It was everything to me, wow. so they did support it. You know, there was right. nothing they could do. <laughs> wow! I would practice my vocal lessons in the room, and they would they would make fun of me because yeah. <laughs> you know, I, like, I was terrible. I'm not the greatest singer. I'm a pretty good backup right. singer. <laughs> You've seen the kind of evolution of Jewish music from you know Shlomo Kolbach to today. How do you see the change? Where do you think it's headed? I was very fortunate to meet Shlomo Kralbach, and then right after that, I did uh, when I moved to America, I met Mordechai Ben David, so I toured the world with him as well. So I was oh, wow. in, in all these different uh, styles of Jewish music. I'm very, 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 very proud of where the Jewish music, if we can call it that, um, where Jewish artists are today. It's more like that. Right. Um, because I think they've been given a voice, and they're, they're the, their level of talent is rising. Um, I do see some things becoming more conservative. Like when I started, uh, I remember my first album, Innocence, it was an album called The Ride. It had one, one little Jewish song on there, right. an instrumental. The rest was all secular. And maybe in the middle of a jam, I would do like a hint to like, you know, right. oh, say shalom. <laughs> you know, in the middle of a jam. And that was huge. And the album went crazy in the Jewish world. And nowadays, if you try to do that, they would, it would, it's not accepted. Right. So it, things are changing in that way. I, I kind of wish that it was more open, and not, but I'm changing too and I'm becoming more accepting and more appreciative of being accepted by the Jewish world. Um, I think it's just uh, starting to blossom and there's a lot of beautiful things happening sure. and, uh, and people like you and, and everybody that I see coming up, it's like, wow, it's, it's great. I guess for you personally, what, what's What's coming up for you? Uh, you know, music is a beautiful thing where you constantly got to get better, keep growing. So um, I love uh, uh, what I'm doing with Soul Farm, all the different events and all the different big Jewish. We just played a big event in Great Neck and we kind of bring this culture to the, to the masses. And with what I'm doing with Dead Grass, um, to all these festivals and all these little theaters that we're playing in and in the studio. Um, the last bunch of years since I built the studio, I love working with different artists. 
I love, that's what I have to give, you know, and, um, and be part of, I like to, I want to be a part of everything. So that's what my world is. That's why I call uh, hey, somebody uh, like you and say, hey, let's do something. Because uh, uh, I want to do everything that I can do. Religion, Yiddishkeit, music, are they two separate things? Are they very much connected? Can, can you have one without the other? It's a very... It's a very deep question, and there's lots of answers to that. Um, being a musician since I was seven years old, I, I lots, of times, lots of times tell people music is my religion, religion. because it actually is. It's like, uh, so that's kind of what defined me. But I am very Jewish, and so, like, you know, oh, Bob Dylan's Jewish, oh, you know, so you connect to... To oh that one's Jewish oh look at you know so that's how I originally wanted it to be reflected that I'm just this popular guitar player that happens to be Jewish, but then meeting Shlomo Karlbach and seeing the depth of uh, of our religion and learning more about it, but at the same time uh, his recommendation was for me not to go to yeshiva so it it showed me that. You, we do what we do. So right. God put me on this earth, I feel, to, to play guitar and to do what I do. And I give it, every time I do it, I give it all I've got. So, th so lots of times I'm looking and I, I, I'm in like, if you took a camera and followed me around, you'd say, here, here he's playing this concert up in Vermont and then the next day playing Shmuley's Bar Mitzvah. You know, right. it's more weddings than Bar Mitzvahs. <laughs> and, then, and then this backyard here and then there. It's like, whoa, what's going on? So I learned to tie it all in together, and it feels like the Yiddishkeit of what we have um, is, the, is very meaningful, and it gives me a lot of inner meaning. Wow. So I love connecting our, our Jewish roots and what we are, because there's 500 million great guitar players out there. We know right. that. A lot of people don't. They say, oh, you're the greatest guitar player in the world. Trust me, there's millions of great, great guitar players. Um, right. But what is it, why do, does what I do connect to somebody? And it's because of what we are on the inside. And that little gig that we did together, yeah. I remember what I was doing touched some people very sure. deeply. And I remember saying to myself at that particular gig, I said, I don't understand what this is. Is it my soul? Is it connecting to others? Why do they appreciate what I'm doing? I'm in the secular world and I see there's a lot of great guitar players and there's a little uh, bit more trouble to get through and um, to, but you know, my dream is to be world famous guitar player. Right. <laughs> you can't let go of your dreams, that's sure. what it is, you know, but Yiddishkeit helps have a deep, deep meaning for, for me in my playing. Wow. And I feel like that's what I'm giving over. You know. I love that. I, I think also for me, to tie into what I was saying before, how, you know, on the one hand, um, I guess our brains try and put everything in their own kind of lanes and it's like, okay, well, this is my career. This is, you know, I also happen to be Jewish, you know, and I'm a family guy and I'm a this. And actually, really, it's like, it is all tied together. And it's like, how do you take all of that and be a good person doing good things, um, you know, yes. as, as, a, as a Jew? Yeah, I remember as a, since I've been doing this as a young age, I remember saying to myself, there's two things I'm going to do. I'm going to, and it had nothing to do with Yiddishkeit really. I'm going to be a guitar player and I'm going to have a family when I'm young. Right. And uh, those are the two things that uh, I work very hard on doing. I've had to sacrifice a lot as being sure. a musician because we're away a lot. And if somebody had a great gig and said, you've got to be away for six months, I'll go do it because mm. I'm crazy about right. what I do. But every time I go visit, you know, my kids or grandkids or whatever, I know that that's the biggest meaning in life yes. is what wow. we're perpetuating and what's, what, what's continuing. I love what you're doing. I love the, the Thank You Hashem movement. And, you know, uh, it's, it's the perfect uh, saying because thank God, like what I'm saying now, thank, thank you Hashem, yeah. I say that to myself many times a day because right. thank you Hashem for everything you know and yes waking up is a big big part of it what I need and so I'm constantly saying thank you Hashem thank you Hashem you never forget that because it, I'm very uh, fortunate to be doing what I love to do it's not easy as we 
as musicians know, there's a lot of work that goes in it that's not glorious. Right. But at the same time, we love it. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you, Hashem, for making this happen for us. Thank you. Is there any um, advice you would give to a younger person who might want to be doing something like this? Um, yeah, it's only an opinion. Okay. I believe that it's like you don't have any choice. It's just got to do it. There's no choice. Um, I understand that there's situations where you have to decide, um, what, am I going to do this or this? But that's how I've always felt. So I can only speak for myself. I didn't have a choice. This is. You're saying you feel like it's your calling. There's yeah, no, it's, no I, I, I can't do anything else <laughs> is right. all I can do. And also, I do believe if you're going to do it, especially music, um, and probably with anything, just each time you do it, give it all you have. Because I think that's what people really could feel, that it just means you're just giving it everything, everything yeah. you have. It's like your last, you know, it's, it's how we should be living all the time, but we don't, re you know, we're not realizing we're breathing, but, oh, yeah, I'm breathing. Right. It's a beautiful thing. So whenever I perform or whatever I'm doing, I try to, like, say, this is, this is the last thing I could do. And it's, it's always the greatest gig of your life. Yes, you all have right. to do that. <laughs> no, I love that. And thank God it's easy for me because I've been doing that for many right. years. Well, um, I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the time. Thank this has been you. really cool. And um, I just, I think we need to finish playing a song. Sure. All right, let's do it.